Hi, welcome back. Today I'm going to wrap up my look at this game, A Bold Stroke, by going through an example of combat. What I've done is take a Soviet equivalent of basically two Soviet corps versus one German corps. The Soviets are looking to take a uh, Bela Surkov uh, as their uh, objective. This has nothing to do with the actual game itself, uh, any kind of scenario or anything like that. I'm just going to go ahead and put these units together and use them as an example of movement and combat um, just to see how those systems work and get a rough estimate of. Um, you know what they're all about and how you would factor factor combat in this game so after that I'll probably move on to something else hi and welcome back to my brief look at a bold stroke Soviet liberation of Kiev 1943 by Spearhead Games today I'm just gonna take a quick look hopefully at uh, the combat system and just run through it using a hypothetical um, mini scenario that I'm just going to use for this example. Um, basically, two Soviet uh, motor rifle corps versus one German infantry corps, roughly in size. So, with that, I'm going to basically start with the first player turn. Let me see here. The first player turn is the active player. First player is the active player for this player turn. And we start with supply and replacement, which does not exist at this time. And then we have the air commitment phase. Both players will decide if and how they will assign any aircraft that are in the ready boxes. Aircraft must be assigned to HQ boxes. In the main game, the real game, you would have way over yonder here over at the edge of the board here are various headquarter boxes and this is where you would put your Soviet ready units air units would go into these boxes in effort uh, in order to perform missions um, to the various units that are located under that particular headquarters so I'm not gonna worry about it right now because it's just not something I want to mess with at the moment because this is just going to be a fairly brief look at combat and stuff, but we'll assume that all of these Soviet air units are where they need to be, as well as all the German units. So, after that we have the first player movement, which will be the Soviets. He'll move any and all or none of his units. Um, and then he may create reserve, re, uh, he may create reserves at this time. And active units that are in reserve mode may only move a maximum of four movement points. So we're gonna do that part first. Since I want to focus primarily on combat, I'm just gonna show you the pre-movement um, phase by the Soviet player. In my hypothetical situation here, Soviets are looking to capture Belaya Zirkov um, in order to win this um, scenario or situation, I guess. So they're going to go ahead and move, and I will show you the positions after they have moved and have um, put themselves into their various combat positions. Okay, this is a look at the post-Soviet player movement. I have released this uh, stack of units back here from reserve. They only get four movement points if you do so, so they're going to be a little bit before they make it to the front line, probably next turn. Um, I have not the headquarter units under here, one of them, and there's a stack of units under there that I have not released yet. 
and I will probably release them on the um, German player turn. Anyway, we've moved up uh, these two stacks of units are going to engage that German stack and these two will engage this German stack supported by um, artillery. I think there's Katusha in here and there might be Katusha in here, I'm not sure. But Anyway, that is how it's going to stand before combat and we shall see how things proceed. Before I proceed with the first player combat turn, I do have the second player um, reserve phase. And this is where the second player can move his units that are in reserve up to four movement points. Uh, I think that's within range of a headquarters. Uh, I'm not sure. Anyway, so we are going to activate this German stack, which is in reserve, and which contains uh, the 4th Panzer Artillery assets, and it looks like the 8th Division, 8th Tank Division, Panzer Division, I guess I should say. And then up here, we're going to activate this stack, which includes an artillery, mobilized artillery, uh, and a tank battalion, and another uh, Panzer Grenadier division. And we will move them up to the front line to give support to the uh, units which are currently under attack by uh, Soviets. And this is the position after the second player reserve movement phase. I bolstered, bolstered this stack with uh, fourth Panzer reserves that were up in fast off, and I bolstered this stack with an artillery or Panzer division, and then I moved uh, the fourth Panzer artillery assets down within two hexes. There's a two right here for range, so they're within two hexes of supporting those tank units there. So, we will now see how the rest of combat is resolved with the first player combat phase. First player now executes the attacks against enemy units that he is adjacent to using the combat procedure. Units may be forced to take losses and retreat while victorious attackers may advance after combat. Units may also be rewarded with partial breakthrough and breakthrough results due to combat. Mark them with the appropriate markers. So I'm going to go ahead and glance over the rules one more time and we'll come back and start resolving these combats. Basically, the camera down here just right. Um, these two Soviet stacks are going to uh, engage that German uh, stack there with this artillery unit in support. Sorry if you can't see that. Get my big fingers out of the way. And then we have two Soviet stacks here which are going to engage that German unit there. Um, just a quick glance back here. I I believe I already said it, but we did not remove these units from reserve, but I did uh, take these guys out of reserve and move them from the Kinev position. Um, like I said, it's going to take them a little while to get uh, get up to the battle line, but they are basically fairly overpowered, and they're just going to uh, bolster the attack if needed, because I... I don't think the Soviets will make a lot of progress on this first attack, so I mostly just want to get, you know, get a feel for the combat situation more than anything, so I'll be back. The Soviet player has made a tactical um, mistake because... All artillery units which move, except for Katusha and mortars, 
may not participate in combat the turn they move. So the artillery unit that is here and the artillery unit that is here have moved and they will not be able to be used in the, in the upcoming combat. Okay, I think I'm ready now. During the combat procedure, and we're going to resolve the one to the south here first. The battle right there, just south of Belaya, Sirkov. Um, I have the aircraft for both sides, which I'm committing to that particular battle, arranged on the left-hand side of the screen. The first thing we're going to do is resolve air-to-air -air combat. And how do we do that? If both sides committed air units to a combat, and if either side committed fighters in a fighter mode as opposed to fighter-bomber mode, see below, there is air-to-air -air combat. If only one side has fighters in fighter mode, the side with the fighters may choose one opposing air unit for each fighter unit he has in the hex. The players then roll a die. If the fighter pilot uh, player, if the fighter player rolls higher than his opponent, his opponent takes one loss from his air unit. Whether or not losses are inflicted, all the fighters and all the opposing units that were attacked by fighters are immediately returned to their respective unready boxes. So, if both sides have fighters in the hex, they are matched off one for one. It's kind of like what I've done there. Two German fighters versus three Russian fighters. If one player has more fighters in the hex, he may choose to double up on a particular opposing fighter or may use the excess to attack enemy bombers or ground attack units. Um, units as described above. In fighter versus fighter combat, each side rolls a die for each pair of opposing fighters. The player who rolls higher inflicts a loss of one on his opponent. In the case of a tie, each side takes a loss. If one side has more strength of fighters in a particular combat, add one to his die roll. If he has more, two if the odds are two to one, three for three to one, etc. Whatever the outcome, all fighters that fight are returned to their unready box immediately after the resolution of air combat. Okay, the first thing we're going to do is resolve um, air to air combat. The first Soviet attack ground attack is going to be aimed at these panzer panzer divisions uh, and utilizing these two Russian stacks and we've committed air power the Russians have three fighters and a ground attack uh, bomber Sturmoviks and the Germans are trying to counter with two fighter units what you basically will do is you will take a ten-sided die, one for each side, and you will roll them. And whoever gets the highest die roll wins. You get a modifier for having extra air units in a battle. And let's see, anything else? I think that's pretty much it. Let me double check real quick. And once they all once the air units fight it out, <clears throat> they uh, all go home except for the bombers, tactical bombers. So let's see here a minute. Fumble my way through here. <clears throat> so in this case, I have two fighters, two Soviet fighters. I'm going to use these two here against this German and this Soviet versus that German. This attack here will be at a plus one to the die roll. Um, I'm not sure where ties go. Let's see, if one side has more Whatever the outcome, all fighters that fight are returned to their unready boxes immediately after the resolution of air combat. <clears throat> Play the rolls of die for each pair. Okay. So, 
Nasty roll. Player rolls the die at the fighter. Player rolls high. Yeah. You roll for each one. Okay. Got that all clear. So, <clears throat> we'll resolve this one first. The two fighters on the outside there. Um, it's going to be even up for both of them. Neither one has an advantage in air numbers. You do not use the numbers on the counters. That is used for ground combat effects only, such as bombing and uh, tactical air. So here we go. Uh, I guess I should have designated who is who. Um, I don't want to do that. Well, the black will be the Germans. And the white will be the Soviets, I guess. Could be the other way around, I suppose, but whatever. Anyway, the Germans come out ahead in that battle, sending the Soviet air unit back to its unready box. And this unit will go home as well. Back to its unready box. <clears throat> okay, then we're going to fight out this battle here. It's going to be one, there's an extra Soviet unit, so there'll be a plus one to the die roll for the um, Soviet player. Soviet player will be white. And it looks like with a plus one, that's a six. It's just one less than the seven. Soviet player is, even with the plus one. So that means that those two fighters are chased off as well as the German fighter. So it looks like what's left is the Soviet Sturmovic uh, fighter bomber. So it and its strength will now be applied to this attack up here. Okay, next in the combat procedure, after we resolve air-to-air -air combat, we total the troop strength of non-artillery, non-HQ units. Uh, ignore parenthesized troop strength of attacking units. Modify as required for hexide terrain. Um, then we add the total of attacking artillery, having their strength as required for swamps or defensive lines. We add the total tank strength. We modify defender strengths for terrain. Calculate combat odds ratios rounding in favor of the defender. We calculate tank anti tank ratio and determine die roll modifiers. We determine air support and then we determine any column shifts as a result of terrain. I don't see any uh, terrain affecting <clears throat> modifiers or anything like that for the clear, or what basically counts as clear. Yeah, no effect. And I'm going to ignore whatever weather it was, um, since I'm just going to give an example of combat here. So, after I've done all that for both the attacker and the defender, and accounted for the air and artillery, I come up with a 2.5 to, 2 to 1 combat ratio, which on the CRT... See if I can get a shot of it here. Uh, I'm gonna be too far away, too close. This is gonna be the two to one column. And let's see, we have the die roll that'll be modified on the left. Okay, so anyway, um, we're gonna be rolling on the two to one column. Uh, with a plus three modifier in favor of the Soviets because they have the greater strength and the greater anti-tank uh, tank strength. The Germans do have anti-tank strength, however, it's not going to make a, it's not going to change anything once you add all the normal strength and the tank strengths together. So, to make a long story short, I'm going to go ahead and roll the die, one die. I'll roll the black one for the Soviets. 
or white, I guess. That's what I've been using. And we're going to be on the two to one column with a plus three. So let's see what we get here. We get a four plus three, that is a seven. Seven on the two to one is a two two. The results to the left, the slash, apply to the attacker. Those to the right are applied to the defender. Uh, all even numbered obligations are selected by the opposing player. Two losses are required in the same combat to eliminate a unit's last step. Um, we're going to have what is known as obligations. Obligations, let me see here real quick. <clears throat> the numerical results are called obligations, which may be satisfied by retreating and or taking losses. The defender obligations must be satisfied first, following, followed by the attacker. The odd-numbered obligations are determined by the owning player, the even ones by his opponent. After the defender has satisfied his obligations, the attacker must do so. If the attacker wishes to advance after combat, he must satisfy his obligations as losses, as he cannot retreat and advance at the same time. So, the defender may not choose how the attacker satisfies attacker obligations. Whatever his choice, the attacker may only choose to satisfy one obligation by a retreat. All others must be taken as losses. So we have two obligations for both sides. Uh, the defender, the Germans, will have to fulfill their obli first obligation because uh, they're the defending player. The second obligation will go to the Soviet player. I'm going to pause here while I uh, do some deliberation on what I'm going to do. Okay, after looking at the rules, um, obligations and losses and retreats and events after combat are um, I don't know how to put it but it's kind of a convoluted process but I suppose if I played it long enough it wouldn't be basically <clears throat> the defender and the attacker both have to um, fulfill two obligations each the first obligation uh, well, actually, both obligations, all obligations are done by the defender first and the attacker. It must be satisfied first, followed by the attacker. Um, then we have the odd even things. The odd numbered obligations are determined by the owning player, the even ones by his opponent. After the defender has satisfied his obligations, the attacker must do so. If the attacker wishes to advance after combat, he must satisfy his obligations as losses, as he cannot, a retreat, cannot retreat and advance at the same time. Whatever his choice, the attacker may only choose to satisfy one obligation by a retreat. Um, all others must be taking, taken as losses. Choose. Okay, so... And then losses, losses in small units, units with a current strength of six or less, and I think that uh, involves everybody in this battle, um, have their significant strength reduced by one for each obligation satisfied by a step loss. Thus, an infantry division with a strength of four, four, two has a one loss uh, marker placed under it when it takes its first loss. This makes its value a three, four, two. When it takes another loss, flip it over to the side that reads 2, 2, 1, and remove the loss marker. The next loss will bring, the, bring back the loss marker, and the value will fall to 1, 2, 1. The final loss will determine, or will eliminate the unit, and that's that. So, in keeping with the con this concept, the strongest unit of the side taking losses must take the first step loss. Except that if armor and anti-tank strength is used in a combat, the first loss must come from the strongest unit, contributing tank and anti-tank strength. Well, anyway. Uh, 
Um, um, I'm just going to kind of muddle, kind of muddle my way through it, but let's see here. I'm going to get some lost markers out because I know we're going to need a couple. Um, I like the combat system. And I like the intri intricacy of it, but um, at the same time, it just smacks me as being just a little bit uh, convoluted. But I think after you played it, like I said, you'll um, it wouldn't be quite so bad. So anyway, the defender will take his first loss obligation and retreat one hex. Now the other one, the Soviet player, gets to decide whether to take it as a loss or retreat. And I think he's going to take it as a loss. So we're going to put a loss marker under this German Panzer Division, 7th. And that fulfills both of the defenders, excuse me, both of the defender's obligations, one by retreat, one by loss. Now the attacker must do similar. Like I say, he cannot advance if he retreats. Um, any loss he takes will come from the anti will come from a tank unit. Let's see, what else we have here? Um, They'll do the same thing. Okay, um, and the attacker will also have to take a loss. <clears throat> because he contributed tank or anti-tank values to the combat. <clears throat> Excuse me, but I have a horrible allergy attack again. Uh, let's see here real quick. <clears throat> Artillery defending or attacking. So, other than that, the strongest unit uh, committing Oh, excuse me. The strongest unit committed uh, that has committed their tank or anti-tank strength. So, they have one more um, loss they can take. I think they're going to have to take it as another step loss because they don't want to retreat and they cannot advance. So, I wonder if they shouldn't just push the uh, push boat. Uh, both of the Germans out. Let's let's uh, redo that. So we'll force both German units to go here, so that we got the one step loss. Check one more thing out here. Gee, I figured I, I think I'd figured this out beforehand. Anyway. Obligations. If the attacker wishes to advance, he must uh, satisfy as losses. So he's got two units, or two um, obligations, sorry. So he must fulfill one another one of those. Um, before he can uh, advance after combat. I think we'll just put a loss under him. And let's see. He was up here. And he was up here. Alright, so that allows these units to advance up to here then. We'll keep these units um, in the back. 
so they'll be available next turn. And that is um, how you factor a battle and resolve combat. Um, I may have made a mistake here and there, but it shouldn't be fatal. I'm going to go up and do the one just above it next. And then I think that will probably be it for this series of videos. Because like I said, I want to move on to some other things. And I think I'm, I've gotten most of what I want to get out of this game. Um, so, with that, I shall be back to resolve the second battle. Okay, we're going to resolve the second combat. Um, we're going to start with the air-to-air -air combat phase. We have a Russian and a German fighter. Also, we have a German bomber and a German Stuka. And the Russians have two Sturmoviks and two bombers. IL's, I'm, I'm guessing. But first of all, we have to uh, roll a die here and see how the fighter-to-fighter -fighter combat comes out. Um, both sides will roll one die, black for the Germans, white for the Russians, and the highest die roll will win. There's no um, modifiers for having extra aircraft in the battle, um, extra fighters, so we're just going to roll straight up. Uh, let's see. It has zero is a 10, I think. So the Russians come up with a 10. The Germans come up with a two. So that will force both of them to go back, but uh, it uh, forces a loss on the German unit, now down to a strength of two if it were to be used as a fighter bomber. So both of these go back to unready boxes. And I think what we do is that clears the bombers through. So that's going to be combat. Get this up a little bit. Combat two forces. There's probably a better way of doing that, but that's what I got right now. Um, I'm guessing the German and German player will. The combat's going to occur in this hex here. Where I have the two next, the two that is next to it. Um, I didn't have all the factors in yet, but I'll apply the air as I need it, I guess, once I figure everything out. And then we have the Sturmovix. The attackers are all coming from the unit moved uh, hex. These guys into frame, and then these bombers will hopefully all be somewhat in frame. All right, then we're going to calculate total troop strengths. Germans have four and a zero, so they will have a four um, total troop strength. Versus the Soviet. One, two, three, four, five. Versus the Soviet five troop strength. We'll add the total of attacking artillery that can participate. Um, the only two that can on the Soviet side or Russian side is the Katusha and the Mortar. Because the other... Artillery unit um, cannot move and fire. And my battery is about to run dead, so I'm going to have to come back after I charge my battery. All right, we're back. This will be a brief video. I'm just going to go ahead and resolve this second combat. Um, I already have it factored, I believe. The ground attack aircraft, anything in, in excess of, uh, I think, plus seven die roll modifiers, 
is ignored. So I'm basically coming in with eight on both sides. Like for every five, you get a plus one. And in this case, they both cancel each other out. So when it, what it all comes down to is going to be a five to one attack with no die roll modifiers. And once again, we're going to be attacking with this stack versus this stack. And there, this is maxed out at 10 stacking points, and that's the limit. So, uh, like I said, we'll be rolling on the 5 to 1 table, no modifiers. And let's see, where's my die at? We're going to be rolling the white die for the Soviets. This should be um, pretty much a Soviet victory, but we'll uh, see what the die says. I roll a 7 on 5 to 1. We get a 2-3. That means the attacker will have to take two obligations, the defender three. Um, I guess the defender will go there and there. That'll help protect their headquarters. Um, the second obligation is a, let's see, in order to advance they have to clear the hex, so this unit will take a one loss marker, <coughs> I think that's about the best they can do, I think they could probably force a retreat, let's go ahead and go with that, I'll go ahead and force a retreat here, and that way they can advance. their armor units, their infantry unit, the artillery will stay behind. Uh, let's see. Yeah, he has to stay behind. And that also brings the armor. Okay, so. I want to double check the stack real quick. I thought it had Katusha as well. But I'm not seeing it. Looks like just armor and infantry. So they will advance two hexes. Since that's what the defender advanced. And then that's pretty much it. The aircraft go back to the unready box, or yeah, unready box. Both sides, <clears throat> and that is pretty much how combat is uh, resolved in the game. There's a bunch of other rules, supply, um, all that kind of stuff. The effects of headquarters, more artillery rules. Um, air power, reinforcements, and all that stuff, but I'm not going to go ahead and play out the rest of that. This has just been kind of a brief overview and example of play, basically. So, I'm going to go ahead and put this video together, <coughs> and I will come back. Looks like we're getting close to um, Pearl Harbor Day. So maybe something in the Pacific, not sure what level, but come up with something. I also kind of want to start um, working on my GDW Lobosets game too. It's a pretty simple uh, series 120 type of game. So I'll probably work on that and something in the Pacific theater, but we'll see. Who knows what's going to happen. Anyway, take care. Talk to you later. Bye.